Hey my pretties, hope you are having a wonderful day and welcome back to the only channel, I think, I'm 70% sure, where we sketch while discussing sketchy stories. You can call me Carly and today our topic is an unbelievable advancement in technology, a truly astounding leap forward for humankind, a creation never before achieved, the most lifelike android ever built. Oh, no, she's she's not an android. Ah, oh, but I picked my whole theme already and, and everything. Okay, well, today we are still talking about Elizabeth Holmes and her giant scam startup called Theranos. So let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Elizabeth was born on February the 3rd, 1984, in Washington, D.C., and like most other self-made billionaires, she was born with only but a silver spoon instead of a platinum spoon in her mouth and had to claw her way to the top on a ladder of daddy and mommy's influential friends. <laughs> it's so moving. It's really the best rags to riches fairy tale since Cinderella. And while we're on the subject, can we please stop referring to these people as self-made billionaires as though they had no leg up in life? It's total hogwash. Forbes, I'm looking at you. Her mom was a congressional committee staffer. Her father's ancestors founded Fleischmann's Yeast and had a, a yeast empire, I guess. Her dad was also a vice president at Enron. Yes, that. Enron. Foreshadowing. And later he went on to work at the USAID and the EPA. Hey Frank, we gotta hire somebody to protect the environment and give aid to the needy. You know, someone who really screams, I care about the planet and other people. Say no more, I know just the guy. I know there's no proof he was involved in the fraud personally, but that's still a really weird career trajectory. It makes no sense. It's like if the Dalai Lama started arms dealing or something. According to a family friend, Elizabeth didn't get good grades at school. So her family had to find a back door for her to get into Stanford. Part of that entailed a summer program to learn Mandarin. She did eventually enroll in Stanford in 2002 to study chemical engineering and promptly dropped out in 2003 at age 19 to create the famous startup, or now infamous startup, Theranos. Was this because she was so bright and had such good business acumen that this career made logical sense? No. Well, I'll let you be the judge of that, actually. The same family friend said that when she was asked about her credentials, she would bring up her ancestors, as you do. And this claim seems to be true if we take into account this quote, which is what one of her father's business connections, the chairman of the company Oracle, said about her. And I quote, She had no background in business, and so it's quite presumptuous for someone to say, I'm going to be the president of this company, but there's an important distinction. That's what I felt when I first met her. After spending a lot more time with her, I learned that her great-grandfather was an entrepreneur and started Fleischmann's packaged yeast. It was very successful, so that was the one side. That's the entrepreneur side. But she was in the medical side. Ah, and as it turns out later, the hospital very near where they lived is named after her great uncle, who was involved with medicine. So she came by both of these two talents necessary here, one medicine and the other entrepreneurship, quite naturally. You could see it by the way she handles things, the way she thinks. End quote. Thank you for your application to the position of Director of Astrophysics at NASA. Unfortunately, your application was unsuccessful. We had a number of very competitive applications, and yours was not among them. Furthermore, we do not see how the following credentials are relevant to the position in question. 
having an uncle who is real good at computers, having a great grandfather who once sat next to Neil Armstrong on a plane, knowing all the lyrics to Man on the Moon by R.E.M. We will not be keeping your CV on file. Please stop calling. Sincerely, HR at NASA. Elizabeth was obsessed, obsessed with Steve Jobs to a creepy level, like get a restraining order, move to Antarctica, enter witness protection, level creepy. She started dressing like him, emulating him. It was really kind of, it, it was creepy. So what is it that Theranos pretended to do? By the way, if you're interested, Theranos was supposed to be a merging of the two words therapy and diagnosis. But every time I hear it, I think of this guy. And come to think of it, every time I hear her voice, first they think you're crazy, then they fight you. I think of this guy. You merely adopted the con. I was born into it. Theranos promised patients the ability to test for conditions, even conditions like cancer and diabetes, with just a few drops of blood instead of the traditional vial. In 2013, Theranos and Walgreens announced that they had struck up a long-term partnership. The first Theranos Wellness Center opened in a Walgreens in Palo Alto, where consumers could then access Theranos' blood tests. In 2014, she was named one of the richest women in the world by Forbes, who then estimated her wealth at $4.5 billion. By December 2014, Theranos had raised $400 million. Elizabeth found ways to put a name on other people's patents, namely Ian Gibbons, the chief scientist at Theranos. He later passed away after an attempt to take his own life, and Elizabeth simply called his grieving widow with absolutely no remorse and asked for all company documents that he had in his possession to be sent to her. She really is just dead inside, isn't she? Just totally cold, with those blank, lifeless eyes and and blinking stare. Where have I seen that before? Ah, oh, right, right. On a personal front, Elizabeth was dating the Theranos chief operating officer, Sunny Balwani, who was 20 years older than her and who she had met at Stanford in 2002. So that would have made her 18 at the time, which feels a bit icky. In 2015, the FDA cleared Theranos to use its tiny blood collection vials to do finger stick blood tests to test for herpes. By October that same year, though, the House of Cards was starting to tumble down. The Wall Street Journal started an investigation and revealed that Theranos was using its technique on only a small number of the 240 tests it had performed up to then, and that the vast majority of the tests were still done with traditional vials of blood drawn from the arm, not the drops taken by a finger prick. But Elizabeth denied these allegations. A day after this article came out, more cracks started showing. Theranos had to stop the use of this blood collection vial for all but the herpes tests due to pressures from the FDA. And later that month, the FDA released two very heavily redacted reports citing 14 concerns, including calling the company's proprietary vial an uncleared medical device. By November, the company's $350 million partnership with Safeway fell apart. In January 2016, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the CMS, sent Theranos a letter saying its California lab had failed to comply with federal standards and that patients were in immediate jeopardy. It gave the company 10 days to address the issue, but Theranos didn't fix the problem. CMS threatened to ban both Elizabeth and Sunny Balwani from the lab business for two years. Theranos voided two years of blood test results and had to correct tens of thousands of blood test reports. This was the last straw for Walgreens, and they pulled the plug on their partnership. In July of 2016, the CMS revoked Theranos' license to operate in California and banned Elizabeth from running a blood testing lab for two years. 
But Elizabeth tried to find a loophole by trying to launch a mini testing lab called Minilab and selling it. Because, I mean, she wasn't banned from selling faulty healthcare products that could kill people, just from creating faulty healthcare products that could kill people. In October 2016, investors started suing Theranos and it was over. Most of these suits were settled throughout 2017, and then Theranos failed another lab inspection, which resulted in the last blood test location being closed down. In March of 2018, the SEC charged Elizabeth and her boyfriend, Sonny, with massive fraud involving more than $700 million from investors through, and I quote, an elaborate, years-long fraud in which they exaggerated or made false statements about the company's technology, business, and financial performance. End quote. Both were indicted on federal wire fraud charges over allegedly engaging in a multi-million dollar scheme to defraud investors as well as a scheme to defraud doctors and patients. Her trial was delayed by COVID and also by her pregnancy, because, by the way, she has since entered into a relationship with a hotel heir. But on January the 3rd, 2022, she was found guilty on four counts of defrauding investors, three counts of wire fraud, and one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. Her sentencing hearing will start in September of 2022. And that's it for today. Quite a short story, but an important one. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what her sentencing will, will reveal. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. And I will see you next time. Bye.